Is in your program guide is uh, Edward Montgomery. I uh, actually shared an office with Sandy. So uh, typical gunmetal gray government chairs. Uh, we got to know each other pretty well earlier in our NASA careers. Very similar background. He worked in uh, aerospace working on uh, defense systems and optics before he came to NASA. Sandy, while he was uh, working uh, for the space agency, had all kinds of cool stuff that he did. Uh, he was the uh, flight project manager for the NanoSail D Solar Sail CubeSat, which is the progenitor of what I'll be talking about this afternoon with the, uh, the near-Earth asteroid Scout. He was the project manager working in the in-space propulsion technology program for the large solar sails that were tested at the uh, NASA's Plumbrook facility and has had a long career working both before, during, and after his time at NASA. He's now working for the Army in high-energy lasers and there's been some tremendous capability advancement in that field. So I'd like to, to hand the podium over to Sandy. Uh, it's absolute honor to be here. I've met a lot of old friends I've known for a long time, and I've met a lot of very new, uh, interesting, creative people here as well. So I think it's a wonderful event, and I hope we can keep doing it. I'm going to talk about something called the solar power pipeline. Now this is a this is a thought experiment I went through. It's very much derivative of the work that Bob Forward did. It's been mentioned already years ago. I took a little different direction than he did. I think it's probably down a direction he considered and decided not to take, uh, but I'm exploring it for different reasons. So let's go into it. I'll talk a little bit about what this thing is I'm calling a pipeline, uh, what it looks like, and what implications. I will get to interstellar travel in the end. Hang on. So uh, we talk about doing interstellar mission. I'm going to start with basic principles. Here's a chart everybody in the room knows, but I'm going to go through it anyway. Uh, we're talking about action at a far, far distance away, how we make that happen. The payload, it's got sensors, it's got probes, we've got to support doing that. We've got a spacecraft that's supporting both it and the propulsion system that goes through. We need energy. We need to get it at a very far distance. That's the job. This, um, <laughs> If you're going to consume things, you're going to take a long time to get there. You're going, even if it's just a robotic probe, you're probably going to consume power. But if there are people on board, then there's the whole life support issue. And uh, you can recycle, but those are not perfect. So there's consumables that have to be considered. And, and propel it if you're going that route. The thing about interstellar space, uh, there was an interesting presentation we, we heard early on about when the uh, conquistadors came to America. They found a very resource-rich environment. Obviously, interstellar space is a void. There is not much to use out there to help us get there. Uh, so we really have two options of what we do. We have to build a rocket with an ugly mass fraction equation to take all that with us when we go out. Or we, uh, we try to extend and put something out there to use along the way. And that's the approach I went down. So, uh, if we're going to take some energy from a good source here at home and take it out in interstellar space, what is a really good source? And there it is. This first <coughs> fact is going to predominate most of what I'm going to go through today in the concept. And it's the basis of what John Mankins is talking about, too. We have a 10 to the 14 terawatt energy source. Gulfs anything else that's going on in the solar system. 10 to the 14 terawatts. Now, that's the total output of the sun. We can't use the total output of the sun because we can't envelop the whole thing and capture all that energy. But how many small fractions of 10 to the 14 terawatts do you need to collect to do something pretty awesome? Not much. So I'm going to allow in some of my concepts drawing away a good bit of energy because I have so much to start with. So what is a good means of getting energy to go over long distance? Uh, well. The purest form we know of coherent light is not the laser. Anybody know? It's starlight, right? It's from a very point source. Coherent light is, it propagates the best and farthest you can as far as moving, moving energy. And the governing equation is shown down there at the bottom for coherent light that the spot size small d is equal to the uh, 
I'll get to Q in a minute, but the range times the wavelength divided by the transmitter diameter. And that Q is how much of the energy are you going to be receiving at the far end of the, uh, at the spot at the end. The small inner area disk is where we usually design systems to receive, is where 84% so of the total output power gets deposited in that inner ring. If you want to also capture the first outer ring, well, you'll get 91%. If you get the first three rings, you can have up to 94% of that power received at the end. Interesting thing to note about those equations is they are independent of what the power level of the source is. It's strictly aperture size and spot size at the end of the wavelength you select to do it at. Okay. So if you solve that equation, you take the aperture size and you take it over the other side of the equation and you produce a product of the spot and the aperture and you divide by the wavelength, you can calculate on the horizontal axis what kind of range between that spot and that aperture uh, is. And that's what that line gives you in, in log plot. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it means that, again, I've, I've assumed a case where you're, you're transmitting aperture in the spot of the same diameter. So if they're both 10 meters, then you see those things are about 1 times 10 to the 4th kilometers apart. That's what that diffraction limit range is. With the laser pointer out there. Yeah, I hate those. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm, in the higher energy laser business, you, you really just get a little afraid to look at laser light. So turn around and accelerate you across the stage. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, go ahead, hit the. So what does this mean? Yeah, I made certain assumptions in this. It's one micron is for this. There's, it's perfect optics. There's no jitter. That's, those are some tough things. But uh, you can add those on the ship a little bit, but not a whole lot. So what's another way to look at this? Well, if you have a 100 meter um, transmitter producing a 100 meter spot, then you're transmitting across distances that are inside the radius of Mercury. This is the distance from the sun on this plot down here. You're right here at this distance. Uh, that's about how far you're going. If you're a thousand meters, then you're transmitting out here in the middle of the solar system. And if you're trying to look at something going to beyond the heliosphere or the uh, local interstellar cloud or after some of these apparently interesting exoplanets, uh, you're talking apertures and spots that are very large. Well, Bob Ford knew this. Uh, he played the game. He didn't make his transmitting and receiving actors the same. He made the transmitter larger and the, the spacecraft smaller. And, and you can play those games with plot by as long as you, you know, keep the number of zeros constant, you can move up and down on either side of those. But uh, even he didn't really talk about going all the way to uh, an exoplanet with the beam. He was just going to put it on the, the interstellar craft as far as it took outside the solar system good distance. Um, go ahead. So what does it mean to have a transmitter in a spot of those size? What does that really fit to? Well, if you're if, in this case where I'm talking about doing this with a sail, putting the laser on the sail, the largest sails we have are very much on the bottom side of that uh, vertical axis there. Uh, if you get above 100 meters, you're talking something that's the largest thing NASA is considered lately, and it's pretty far in the future before they even talk about building it, something on the order of a cruise ship in diameter. Now that's the diameter. We have to build an area that big. Keep going. Uh, there are a number of objects in the uh, near-Earth objects flying around, quite a bit. I was amazed how many are, are out there in, the, in the, that size of just under 1,000 meters, from uh, like 600 to 1,000 meters, nearly a million near-Earth objects if you want to turn those into some kind of a system, they have that kind of diameter. But if we want to start building things that are get out to the heliosphere and beyond, we're talking about you know, truly, truly very large, large, large apertures to try to beam something that far to the next one. Uh, state of Colorado to get you out to those planets. Um, and there are probably other very physical reasons why you can't go that far in. Honestly, uh, as I've worked on various optical systems, large ones. We worked on the Hobby Everly Telescope in Texas. And it's very difficult to build an optical precision surface 
of a great distance because it all comes down in two cases to both manufacturing and to control of that, that precision, that surface, and measurement. Now you have to go from a datum. And when you get very far away from that datum, the certainty of the precision of what you've done gets worse. So the larger and larger you go, the harder it is to maintain a 10 to the minus 6 micron if you're talking about that kind of wavelength of precision across it. And so uh, I didn't really feel comfortable going as far as Bob did and you know, other folks in very, very large arrays. I wanted to try to keep something into a kind of a limited range. Well, one thing that's very interesting, of course, is that we have this, uh, this 10 to the 14 terawatt source is putting a lot of irradiance out to the solar system. Um, I think it's kind of a, I don't know if it was an enticement or a trick on us or what, but at one AU, the, you know, 1360 watts per square meter means you have to have something about the size of a small swimming pool to run your hair dryer. It's not a, a lot of power. You gotta collect a lot of it. As John's shown you how, good ways how to collect that, and that's good. Uh, but boy, you go start going inner solar system this thing, and that really goes up. It's going up as a square in the distance of that. And I've done some trades I'm going to show you that, that start with putting a collector in mercury and collecting things at, you know, about 8,500 watts per square meter. But consider, you know, going even closer to the sun, go off that chart to about like a quarter AU, and you see a thing really goes way up to the top of the screen here. So. Uh, there's a thermal consideration of what kind of systems can survive when they get that close to the sun. I haven't done those calculations in this. I acknowledge that they're there. It's probably worth interesting calculating what those can be. I know Jeff Landis has done a lot of that work on what kind of cell material can survive close to the sun. Okay, another issue that you have to deal with is coherent light. The sun is not coherent, right? The sun is an incoherent source. Starlight's coherent because it's very far away and because it's a point in space. And so I worked with that with this uh, theorem which describes when a, a source becomes coherent. It has several uh, key principles you have to meet in order to do that. And some of those is that, well, first they say that the source itself has to be incoherent to begin with. And uh, only pulsars and mazars, I think, are, are that in nature. Um, but the angular size of the source has to be very small. Of course, the sun uh, really seems very large at times, but actually it depends a very, very small uh, angle. From Earth, it's about a half, if I got that backwards. No, about half a degree. Uh, how small is a small of an angle? Actually, I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't got the trades of what exactly that means when it falls off, but a half an angle doesn't seem like a big angle to me. You've got to realize the dimensions of the solar system. I don't know if there's a, in Huntsville, the Space and Rocket Center, there's an example of the solar system where the front door of the museum is the sun. You walk out you know, 40 or 50 steps and you find Mercury, the little pea sitting on a stand out there, and then you go out in the parking lot to find Venus, and the, you know, Pluto's in the next county, and these are very, very small objects. So, you know, we tend to put these things on screens with the big sun and the planets sitting next to them. And uh, honestly, the, the geometry of the situation is much, much different than that. The apparent size of the sun, you would think at a quarter AU, was filling the sky. But it's still only a couple of degrees uh, subtended arc there. Uh, another thing is about uh, a coherent source is it needs to be quasi-monochromatic. Um, and their, their rule on that is that the, uh, the width of the band spread has to be, you know, plus or minus one amount of the central wavelength. So if you're picking one micron like I'm doing, I'm talking about trying to capture from 400 nanometers up to 1.2 microns. You know, the solar spectrum runs from about 400 nanometers, the strength of it, to out beyond two and a half microns, really. So I am chopping off you know, 30 or 40 percent of that spectrum to try to capture it and make it be act like or consider it as a quasi-monochromatic source so it fits this coherent propagation equation. And the other thing is it has to be in the far field. And that's why stars twinkle and uh, you hear a lot of times that the, well, the sun doesn't. Planets do or don't. Uh, most astronomers will tell you they do not consider planets to be a 
a truly coherent, it isn't a perfectly coherent source, that's for sure. But uh, if you're talking about these relays, and you're talking about putting telescopes up there looking at other relays at some coherent distance away, uh, there's a certain distance they have to be apart before that far relay looks like a point source. And the calculations are there in the bottom. And uh, 10 meter apertures work well, 100 meter apertures work well. When you get to 1,000 meter apertures, the, uh, the range equations you're getting away are beginning to uh, get so far out that you're, you're, it doesn't work very well. Uh, okay. So there's no such thing as a purely coherent source. Uh, every laser experiment we've ever put up on the bench, just about, uh, had to have a spatial filter. And you can order these from any uh, Newport or Oriel or any of the places. It's a pinhole. And it, you know, it clips out the outer uh, parts of the, uh, the diffraction pattern where some of the distortions are that are caused by whatever is causing it here in, down here on Earth. It's uh, atmosphere aberration sometimes. It's imperfection in your objects. But uh, it's, it's a good way to clean up the noise in a beam and make it appear to be more spatially coherent and work that way. And uh, so the first collector is important here. We're going to put our first station close to the sun, collect a lot of that deep power, and we want to turn it from that incoherent source into that coherent source and start pulling it out of the solar system and building a bridge to pour uh, into interstellar space. Uh, I'm hoping that we can do that just optically and spatial filtering. That's a hope. Uh, a lot more study has to be done to see whether, to what degree we can do that. If not, we have to capture it. We have to change, uh, you know, convert it to some usable electrical energy, re-emit it using a laser. Those are lossy processes, you know, probably at best 30, 40 percent for both of those. I'll accept that if we need to do it. Again, we have 10 to the 14 terawatts to <laughs> beginning out of the source. Uh, and even if we're going to use one hundredth of one percent of that, we're going to capture just a few square meters of sky. We started with 10 to the 14. I can throw away many orders of magnitude and still have a lot of power coming down that pipe. Uh, so we put a collector and a transmitter right next to the sun. We go upstream. And what does that next relay system look like when it looks back at the sun and looks for it? And that's what the small dot above pipeline is. Uh, again, that's a not to scale picture because if I made the size of that detector, then it would be so small that it wouldn't be a displayable pixel on the projector here. But go ahead and hit it. Huh, that's interesting. Well, anyway, okay, so what does this relay look like? Well, it's two telescopes. One's a receiver, a collector, if you will, and one's a retransmitter. Um, um, we want to build in a way so there's a minimum amount of beam conditioning required. We, uh, we want to make it a high precision optical system. <coughs> Again, we want to avoid this conversion if possible. Uh, we want to build out of gossamer structures if we can to reduce the mass of these things we have to put out in space. No, I haven't done the thermal analysis. And yes, these relays are going to be orbiting around the sun and you're trying to get to some point in space and there's an orbital mechanics, uh, you know, uh, uh, coordination of, of, of uh, different systems you have to, to build. There's an orbital mechanics issue to deal with as well. I'm going to assume or defer that problem later. But go ahead. Uh, okay, can we really relay laser coherent light? Yeah, sure, it's been done. It's uh, not on the scales of some of the things I'm talking about here, but it was done many years ago uh, in the relay mirror experiment that DOD uh, put up. It was a beam was launched up to Haleakala, up to a telescope, uh, reflected back down and caught at a research station at the bottom of the mountain. Go ahead. Uh, this is the, a device, uh, it's called the Aerospace Relay Mirror System. And you'll notice the, something that looks like a collecting telescope on one end and a retransmitting telescope with rather the same configuration on the top of it. And this was something that's meant to be placed at high altitude and redirect a, an iron to laser beam from the ground to a target anywhere around. Uh, 
we can conjecture that the central part of the system probably has adaptive optics on it because this has to operate in atmosphere. Fortunately, in space, we don't have that issue. But uh, it is, you know, it's not a recollection uh, conversion. Sending out, generating new laser light. It's, it is just capturing and taking a beam out the other way. Uh, a lot of stuff's tracking that has to be done in it. So, this is, at least in terrestrial distances, a known technology. And uh, you can also find out on the web, you know, some uh, concepts for these kinds of collectors and retransmitters in several different forms. Uh, for orbital mechanics require you to, uh, if, if you can go left and right, or if you need to go perpendicular to whatever your path is, you just get a parabolic, there's different, different ways of doing that. And you'll notice that uh, these are Cassegrain type telescopes um, that come to a focus, great place for spatial filtering, that's where you usually do that. And in fact, as you, you're catching beam goes off the edges and you come through these kind of constrictions within the system. You're also uh, doing some scraping, some, some spatial filtering. So a lot of that's inherent to what's going on there already. Go ahead. The two of them don't have to be the same size. They can be, you know, the collector can be a different size than the transmitter. Um, I mentioned Gossamer Technologies. Uh, quite some time ago, collectors uh, of this type of, were built for uh, a solar thermal rocket program, the Air Force uh, sponsored at the time. Uh, Paul Garreau in the bottom right image uh, was a solar collector, an off-axis solar collector that was built. Uh, Paul is uh, part of the same, some of the same group that ended up uh, producing the gossamer material that these sails are made of in the end. It uh, hasn't been a whole lot. Uh, Lagarde, of course, did the inflatable am antenna experiment for NASA, which was a large uh, deployable in space uh, concentrator optic. So there's a, a beginning. It's, it's not where it would need to be to quite do this, but the, uh, I think the fundamentals of how you can do these gossamer structures are there, and they just need some a little additional work. Uh, yes, yeah, so chromatism, if we're talking about trying to take a a broader band, a pinholter, a coulter is really designed for usually a single wavelength, and so there's a band over which it works. Uh, these kind of things would have to be investigated. I want to acknowledge that. Okay, so uh, here's one of the, the, the things that's uh, a curse the first time you think about it. Okay, if you're going to collect something and you're going to have a relay, and that's going to go to another relay, well, aren't you blocking the one in front of it? So I did some of the math that looks at what the uh, length of the number. If this is your second relay, you know, I took our two telescopes and I smashed it with a very thin area, and there they are. So if uh, the sun comes out, collects in the first one, it retransmits to this one. You might think that, well, this one's blocking all the sunlight to get to this one. And actually, that's not true very close to the inner solar system. Take out the math and work on that. The, 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 uh, the distance of that umbra is uh, a function of, of, kind of the, dis the diameter of the sun, the distance away from the sun you are, but uh, for a very large distance, it, uh, it's not true that you actually, in the second relay, not only do you capture the energy sent from the first collector, but you also collect another whole set of sunlight. So it, it increases as you go on. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so here is taking concept of a 100 meter diameter transmitter and receiver, both the same size. Put this in the orbit of Mercury. First relay is orbit of Mercury. And what's coming out of that 100 meter circuit concentrator is 60 megawatts in the order of Mercury. Uh, by the time you get to Venus, actually there's a typo. The second line says four relays. That's incorrect. It's actually after 13 relays to get to the orbit of Venus. It has increased from 60 to 95 megawatts because of that recollection of more of the solar lines you go through. By the time you get out to Earth, you've gone through 23 relays. 
I looked and told him, oh, the power's gone down. What's going on there? Well, I didn't assume perfect transmissions. First of all, you lose 16% of that, those outer airy disks, even if you do a perfect coherence. And, uh, and then I also assumed on top of that, there's going to be 10% loss, and that's probably optimistic, of uh, you know, coatings that aren't perfect, uh, optics that aren't perfect, uh, tracking that's not perfect, jitter that occurs, so all the, the small things that come into it will eventually catch up with you, and especially as you go into the outer, further away from the sun, and the, the R squared irradiance comes down from the sun, you're not collecting that much more, and eventually the losses overwhelm you, and that was the unfortunate result is for the interstellar work, as I was, I was trying to make this work for it, go on to the next one. We'll look at what some of that means. Okay, on the uh, horizontal axis here, distance from the sun again, I placed these 100 meter relays out there working at one micron. The power out of each of the uh, relays is shown in the vertical axis, and you can see, in fact, they do grow up to about 130 megawatts by the fourth relay, but then those uh, the losses begin to overwhelm the additional solar input, and they start coming down. Yeah. Obviously, for lesser efficient transmissions, that break point's going to be closer to the sun, and for more efficient ones, maybe they come further out. Go on to the next one. So let's try to do a little better. Uh, let's look at a thousand meter rather than a hundred meter collector and retransmitter. Again, one micron, 10% loss. It never really does grow, and it drops. And as we get out to the end of the heliosphere. There's virtually nothing less. The result of this, this is not the pathway to interstellar science. <laughs> Sorry, wish it was. But maybe it does have some that. Go on. Uh, yeah, okay, if you want to know the number of relays it takes to get to Proxima Centauri or some of those things, it's 100,000 million. Doesn't really seem practical. Uh, but, however, there were, as you saw in this example, megawatts, hundreds of megawatts, gigawatts available in the inner solar system. And those are the kind of power levels that seem interesting for doing solar cell departures from the solar <coughs> system. So if you have a system like this, it makes for a more energetic launch of a cell system than you might otherwise have. Uh, go ahead. One more. Yeah, and there's a plot that just shows a the yellow line being the R squared uh, losses of power, and then the, uh, the pipeline being that much more for these businesses in the inner solar system. So that's it. Very good. I always want to make time for at least one question. Does anybody have a, a question? Uh, I'll, I'll I think I saw Joe's big hand come up first, yeah. so let's go ahead and go back to what kind of solar materials are all of these data based off of? Are they perovskite? Are they silicon based? Um, polymers? What, what kind of stuff are we dealing with here? Well, one of the reasons I didn't consider anything in my calculation is closer than a quarter I used because when we were going through the solar cell program, they were composed of polyimides, aluminum coatings on the outside. And Chromium on the back for uh, to get the thermal situation worked out. So this polyimides something Okay, so improvements with the materials, especially uh, for the further out solar cells, would possibly even help further this along. Absolutely. All right. Very good. Thank you, Sandy.